go. There we go. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us. Hello. The Mandalorian and the Jedi have a long history in the galaxy far, far away, and both are rebuilding in the show's era. Is Grogu a nexus point for those two cultures to perhaps unite under Tar Vizsla's dark saber? That's a very interesting perspective. You know, he is definitely somebody who has spent time in both worlds. And uh, we know that he started off uh, earlier in the Jedi Temple. We've seen flashbacks to that, uh, that, that speak to that. And then we know that he's been rescued and spent many years with the Mandalorian, went back with, with Luke. Now we've been two years apart from him there training. What's interesting is that as he chooses to return to his friend, the Mandalorian, because he's developed an attachment, it's interesting how that echoes in a way Luke's path when he was, you know, was drawn to the attachment to his friends and how that helped shape the future. So I think that you're pointing out an interesting thing that, that we definitely discuss a great deal of where does he sit and who has come before him and, and what is the relationship of those two civilizations? Mm -hmm. Because the, the Mandalorian armor, as Dave has taught me, uh, uh -oh. you know, was developed to counteract all of the natural abilities that the Jedi had and made it a more level playing field. So we have a lot to draw from, both from the Clone Wars, where they both cooperated and fought. And we also have ancient history, as, as, is, uh, as we saw in games and an extended universe, where we know what you're referring to, which is that they didn't get along very well in the past. So that's a very interesting, valid perspective. Deep question. Hi. Hi, Dave. Hi, John. Such an honor to speak with you today. One thing we see a lot of in Star Wars is the connections between generations, often in the form of master and apprentice or father and son with Din and Grogu. Why do you think this dynamic is so compelling? I think that, you know, we're all, as we grow up, we're all always seeking knowledge. We're always seeking to be understood and to understand the world around us better. I think that, you know, in so many disciplines beyond even a martial art, there is a master and apprentice. You know, in a very real way, I felt fortunate that George was my mentor for many years to even learn how to make Star Wars. So those relationships in your journey through life, you find people that know more than you and that help educate you, that help you on your way. Um, and so I think it's just something that we all understand consciously, unconsciously. Uh, I think in the, when you add a family dynamic to it, like Mando and Grogu, it's even more powerful because we have that relationship in our life uh, from the beginning. And, and you know, in Star Wars Rebels, we explored how that relationship can be different. It's It can be an adoptive family. It's not even necessarily you know, the family that you're born into. And I think in Star that Wars, that seems to be it more seems powerful. It seems to be something that happens quite a bit. And that, and that your bloodline isn't necessarily the most... The uh, most defining thing, right. yeah. Mando and Grogu are an ad adopted right. to. Mando was an outcast and Grogu was adrift. So I, I think people feel these ways and that's why they want to see characters overcome them. We want to see, you know, we are dying for Mando to shut the ship off and go get Grogu in season one. That's the right thing to do, and we want to believe that we're going to do the right thing. We want to be Luke and be brave enough to not rely on the targeted computer and turn it off. We want to believe in ourselves, But it takes everything that these stories tell us leading up to that moment to get these characters over that hump and do these things. But I think that's why we, we respond to it. Uh, we see the characters do things that maybe we're not quite capable of yet, but they give us confidence to take the next step, hopefully, in life. Hi, hey gentlemen. This is Sarah and Richard from Skywalking Through Neverland. It's great to see you guys again. Yeah, bright suns. Bright you know, suns. <laughs> <laughs> we know you can't give too many deep cuts on this upcoming season, but can you give us some deep cut Easter eggs to look out for? Well, that's part of the fun of the Easter egg is that it's something that you find, right? Isn't that, uh, isn't that it? I will say that we um, go, we, we really try to do everything we can to find uh, aspects of Star Wars that maybe is unexpected for us to include. And I think that we had a lot of fun at first with drawing from the Star Wars holiday special with the AMB and the, the pulse rifle. And, and also the, the, the Camtono being the Will Rose Hood's um, ice cream maker. I think that the part of that I'm enjoying the most about this process is that 
no matter what part of fandom you're from and no matter what you grew up with and what what era you connect with, we want to make sure that everybody has it's we have something for everybody here and that everybody's welcome to be part of it, even if you're a new fan. You know, even if you're starting off, hopefully I think that was one of the nice things about the original the first season is that these were characters it now if you knew about Star Wars, hopefully there was a lot of rewards for all your all the time spent reading the books or watching the, the movies or the or even the TV shows. Uh, but if you were new, you were just as welcome, arguably more welcome, because it's like you, we have to invite the next generation in. And it's always been uh, an open door for young people. And, and as a kid, I remember, I still remember I felt 10, 11 years old. It felt like it was for me, but it didn't feel like it was pandering. And so we try to we we want to try to make everybody feel um, that there's something for them here, and we talk about that quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And we have directors from different segments of of the of the entertainment world bringing different perspectives. That's animation, independent film, you know. So all of it is meant to really make that it feel like how it feels when you're at celebration, you know. <laughs> You have people from all around the world dressed as different characters, different ages, and everybody's happy and taking pictures together. That's what it feels like for us, and that's what we want to try to capture with the show. Well, thank you very much, and ignite the spark. <laughs> well, oh, there. Hello. Hello. It Hello. It's insane to be before the mighty Dave Filoni and John Fox. Oh, wow, mighty. <laughs> thank you. Wow. You're too kind. Well, oh, i got to put my heart back in my chest. All right. <clears throat> So The Mandalorian has been praised for its ability to tell a story that resonates with audiences on a very deep level. So if art is a form of a mirror, what do you think Din Djarin's character reflects back to us about ourselves and our society? Well, I, for me, I can only speak personally. What, what, I, what appealed to me about Mando from the beginning was that he's somebody that's very protected. He's inside armor. And while that armor gives him a benefit, it also has him, I thought, incredibly closed off. And I think that we feel that way. We put on our armor a lot these days and, you know, everything feels very combative and the world outside maybe doesn't feel as friendly to us. And so we're armored up. But the significant thing for Mando is that, you know, when he meets Grogu, that all changes. It's small things at first and it becomes simple kindnesses i'm protecting him why because he's worth money but then he ends up protecting him because it is the right thing to do and so i think that you know mando as a character is reflecting this armor but we have to ask ourselves what does that armor really mean what is its value it is his face but when he finally takes the helmet off and and grogu sees his face and he touches his face at the end of season two it it becomes something more it becomes I'm showing you my true face, my true self. I'm allowing myself to be vulnerable. So I think that those are the things that really appeal to me about Mando, and it's allowing us maybe to, to take our own helmet off and be more visible to people. I mean, that's, that's the way I read it. I don't know if you feel that way, but there you go. Does that help? <laughs> Thank like you. It. Hello, gentlemen. It's a pleasure to speak to you again. Um, the the question I've got, uh, and I'm sure Dave, you've you've fielded a lot of these, uh -oh. um, is just uh, you know a lot of the the cinematic influences in Book of Boba Fett. There's definitely a lot of Lone Wolf and Cub in um, the choice Luke gives Grogu. But John, you mentioned in an right. interview, Paper Moon, yeah, and I went mm -hmm. back and rewatched it again, and that movie's so good, and it hit me yeah. right between the eyes. And I'm wondering if you could, if if you both could kind of speak to the conversations about your influences in this in this coming season uh, and stuff that might be surprising, like like Paper Moon. I think some of it just is, you know, the writing process and filmmaking process, but especially the writing process is not really a, a conscious one for me. We do a lot of discussion about, and very much a conscious set of decisions about the broad strokes of where we're going to go and what we're going to do. But when you're actually letting the characters talk to each other and the story is unfolding, if you're if you're doing a good job writing, it doesn't always feel you don't always know what's going to happen next, and and you're really a product. Your subconscious is really a product of all your influences, and Paper Moon was a very strong influence on me, and and and, and a lot of movies of that time period. I'm 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 now in my you know I'm 56, I think yeah I think I'm 56. At my age, you start to lose track of the years, but late 50s. The number and uh, and. 
you know, I grew up with, with the Bad News Bears, and I grew up with, you know, P Paper Moon. And, and films like that had, you know, there were such interesting relationships of misfits who feel like they're, don't belong anywhere, but, but these, family, these family relationships emerge. And then the family relationships are often stronger than, than the bloodline relationships, and that's certainly a hallmark of, of Star Wars. You know, families develop around these characters that are spending time together, and bonds are forming. And people are changing who they are based on the experiences that they have together. Look at the arc of Han Solo in the first film, somebody who seems to be very selfish. And I think that that progression from selfishness to living for something and sacrificing for people or somebody, something bigger than yourself is very much a part of Star Wars, but, but the hero's journey and everything that George learned from Joseph Campbell as well. We're a communal species. We're a, co a cooperative species. And we are rewarded in, in, the, in the throw of history for when we act in that way, when we think about, when th we think about things that are more important than just our own individual needs. And so Paper Moon is such a wonderful film because you think it's all about transporting this character, you know, to their living relative after their mother passes away. And then we figure out it's a bit ambiguous, but it's suggested that maybe she, ended, she was actually his daughter. What's interesting because the actors are actually father and daughter. But the idea that when she finally gets delivered to where she belongs, you realize, no, that journey was what reinforced it, and that bond was what was important for both of them. And so the unexpected twist of her leaving behind this cushy life that she could have had and going and, and being a con, a con artist with, uh, with, with Ryan O'Neill, I find an a unexpected and fulfilling and really satisfying ending. And it's just a beautiful movie. And, and, um, and so as you point out, we, you know, we, we, are, we do find influences in, in cinema stylistically but also story-wise because great stories have been told before and Star Wars is a wonderful way to encapsulate a lot of what came before and, and, and serve it up to a new generation in a, in a, slightly, different, uh, a slightly different context. Hello, gentlemen. This is a question I ask my mythology students, and I'm excited oh to see what the two of you think about this. I want to see if you can talk about the symbolism of Din Djar initially struggling with wielding the dark lights, the dark saber in the Book of Boba Fett. That's a great. That's a great question. I'm glad you caught that. You know, because on the one hand, you're super excited because I look as the first person who ever wielded the dark oh saber. Oh boy, here we go. As as uh, as pre Vizsla, go. I could say that it was a. Uh, <laughs> That George, you know, that was a reshoot, by the way, because I was originally. Yeah. That's a public record, right? It was. A, it was originally when a I recorded blade. the voice. It was a vibroblade, mm -hmm. and when George had seen it cut together, uh, I, I found out from Dave because I got called back into the recording booth that no, the vibroblade can't block another lightsaber. It has to be, and he and he created this lore around the dark saber that was stolen from a Jedi temple, and the idea of mm -hmm. Tar Vizsla, somebody who was a Jedi and a Mandalorian, like. And, and I remember, like, I got to go back and record this. I told my wife what, what I was doing. Like, I got to go back, and I just I got to do it again. And she was like, George is right. That's super cool. <laughs> super cool. And she was right. Like, it ended up being this compelling image of what this thing is. But then also I got my clues from Rebels where, uh, you know, when, when, um, Sabine. when Sabine was learning to, to wield it, it was heavy to her. Mm -hmm. And the sense that there is, you know, it's almost like the teachings in, in uh, martial arts of, like, you know, you can't, you can't grab water. You have to. You have to cup your hands, and you, it's not something you could control. You have to flow with it. And the Mandalorian, somebody who probably doesn't have a lot of force abilities and doesn't have any training in it, and who's who's great at every other weapon, this thing is heavy. And you notice when Paz Vizsla picks up the dark saber to use it, it's, it ends up being the thing that that uh, probably loses the battle for him in the Book of Boba Fett. That he's even stronger, but it's even heavier to him. And so that whole Excalibur sword in the stone, mm -hmm. if it's your, if you're fated to do this. So there's something larger that's allowing you to wield these things, and they become mythic or symbolic metaphors for whether this is your destiny and, and if you're trying to force something. So, you know, the, 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 the strongest knights in the land could not budge the sword and pull it from the stone. And you want to fill in the rest of the, that? No, I, no, it's all very good. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you did wield the sword, so you do now. But yeah, I think it's, it's, it's a matter of, you know, when you're wielding a weapon like that, it is a lot of what's in your mind and in your heart more than your physical prowess. 
And I think that that is what Kanan was trying to teach Sabine. She's fantastic at, she's a great warrior, but she's not balanced in her mind. All of her struggles with her family are preventing her from growing, are preventing her from being balanced in her body. And so, you know, with Mando, he comes into this thing the right way because he doesn't really even want it. But that lack of wanting it is almost like a lack of responsibility. It's saying that, well, why don't you value it? And how can you wield it if you don't really even value it? So there's... It's and also he a good hurts metaphor. him. Well, it's also cool in, 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 he is when he himself. hurts right. him. He's yeah. using it. He's like limping around like this yeah. thing. Imagine, because I always thought about that like a lightsaber. If you don't know how to use it, it's a fumble. That's got to be a, a bigger. Roll. That's that's not. Yeah, it's not a good. <laughs> it's. I, it always amazed me that they weren't hurting themselves more. With well, I think things. a lot of people did. You just didn't hear about them because <laughs> <laughs> you hurt yourself. You're not in the story anymore. Right. You fall right. out of but, it. But uh, yeah. But he's. They're all having. I was uh, always shocked when Han used Luke's lightsaber to cut open the tauntaun. I thought that was a big move but he's smart you know but he all he does is make a little yeah that's slit. it one quick that's thing yeah not a not, big deal no, no, no he's not fighting he doesn't want to use it. that thing. it's like here's the other thing about a lightsaber by any definition of the world they live in it's a really old weapon right so i've talked about this it's not as work. cool to them you were saying no as it's it is not like a samurai is an incredibly well-trained warrior and that seems great and they're highly effective and they're very smart and they have a way of being and then rifles come around. And when you see the Seven Samurai, you see how just di- how difficult it is for these incredibly skilled warriors with a great, you know, with a philosophy and a way of life, but they just get thoughtlessly taken out by someone with a rifle. And so, you know, it's up to Kyuzo to go in and, and take out as many as he can, and it's dangerous because technology is overcoming what skill and discipline has given them. And that becomes a quick and easy path to power Right, is now we have a, a, a weapon, a blaster that can just, you know, take take down a Jedi. So now we have more people with more blasters. And that's a, like, it is an old, elegant thing to wield a lightsaber. And it takes a tremendous amount of training and discipline to wield it. You just can't pick it up and use it. So all of that then fits in with George's philosophy about the Force itself, which is, yes, we are all part of the Force. We are all connected. We all have it. But it takes a great deal of training and discipline to understand how to wield it. And very few people uh, have that discipline. In, in our own world, we see that. We, it's so hard to be disciplined to do things that are good for us, physically, mind, body, spirit. So it's, it's, it's true in the Star Wars universe as well. Thank great talking much. to you. And hopefully we'll see a celebration. celebration. Yeah. Hopefully, yeah, celebration. <laughs> Cheers. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank Thanks you. for Bye, the guys. questions. Bye. Great question. Great question. Yeah, always great yeah. questions. Yeah. Always. Hey, look at those names to the left. They are part of the Skywalking Force, our Patreon. Become a producer yourself and check out all the Disney Plus themed bonus content available depending on the level you subscribe. Become a member of the Elite Skywalking Force at skywalkingforce.com.